Hi there. Say hi to that. You can say hi or wherever there, you want. Or you. Say hi to hi. everyone. Just say hi to the room. <laughs> How are you? I'm, I'm actually, I've never been happier or better. So thrilled to have you here. Thank I was you. up late devouring. So you told devouring me. Devouring this book. I loved it. Absolutely Did you? Absolutely loved it. Yeah. How does it feel to have this out there, to have a book? You're, it's a very simple title, by the way, Rita Moreno, A Memoir. Well, I, I think that's what makes it, the, the cover so elegant. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful shot mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. um, so how does it feel to see it? You know, this is going to live on. This is going to live on forever, your story. It, it's, it's, it's still kind of hard to digest. Yeah. I, I believe it, but it's hard to take it in. I'm, I'm very excited. My daughter is beside herself. She's thrilled. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good. So I know that you were, you did a one woman, not a one woman show, but you did a show, um, telling, sort of a stage show that was called. Yeah, so I did a play at the Berkeley Repertory right. Theater about uh, two and a half years ago, maybe three, called Life Without Makeup, which right. is the story of my life. Right. I love that title. Yeah. And um, it worked so fabulously well. The audience was so enthralled with it and moved and all that that uh, I finally decided that maybe I should do a book. I'd been asked for years, and uh, I, I just never wanted to do it. It was daunting, and I would have to reveal myself and all that. And now that I'm 81, you know, it's, uh, it just seems okay. You said your daughter is thrilled that you've, you did it, uh, and you have grandchildren. She hasn't read the book yet. She hasn't read? Well, I was going to ask you. I think, she's putting, I think she's putting it off. And I said to her, <laughs> you know what? That's fine with me. You don't have to read it until I'm gone if you want. I don't care. Was there anything scary about, was there anything you were nervous about putting in the book because of your daughter, or is there anything like that? Well, you know, there's always the part when we talk about Marlon, I talk about Marlon Brando. It, it, oh, it's, him, it, yeah, that guy. That guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was a very uh, lusty relationship, and it was a very tormented relationship, yeah. and all kinds of stuff relationship. And uh, she might have, she might be uncomfortable with that. It's, it is your mother, and the reason Marlon it plays such an important role is that because he played a very important role in my life. Yeah, he took up you know a big hunk of my life. Yeah, uh, you know how she feels about it eventually is you know it's, it's her problem now. Right. Uh, she's a big girl. She's a very grown up woman with two children, and if something disturbs her, she'll have to deal with it. But. Uh, that makes it sound like she's going to have some awful stuff to deal with, and I don't think so. I think she's going to be, I think she's going to be surprised at some stuff, and I think she's going to be moved. You talk very frankly about your marriage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are abortions, you know, yeah. suicide attempts. Um, yeah. Is that is that stuff that you think earlier in your life you would have been as willing to, or do you just sort of cross a line? And you just I, say, well, no, here I it don't is. think so. I don't think so. More than that, since I, I go into a great deal of my so-called perfect marriage, which wasn't, mm. that I certainly could never have written this when my husband was alive, which was only, you know, three years ago. So let's talk about some of this. So this, okay. this little girl, this little, this pretty little girl here, <laughs> you describe how moving from Puerto Rico to New York was like going from Kansas, no, from Oz to Kansas. It's like the opposite exactly. of, of, of Dorothy. Yeah. Going from uh, this, this beautiful, colorful world. Paradise, into th that, that uh, chapter is called Paradise Lost. I was living in a paradise. It's a beautiful island. Yeah. And it was the happiest toddlerhood for me. I came to this country when I was uh, six, I believe, and um, or maybe five. And, uh, you know, to suddenly see nothing but gray and concrete. And for the first time in my life, I saw a tree. It was February, freezing. For the first time in my life, I saw a tree without leaves. Wow. And I said, I was on the bus with my mom. I said, what happened to those trees? And she said, oh, it's just something called winter. Can we talk about the bed bugs? That freaked me out. You talked oh, about yeah. the, bringing the mattress up to the roof. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, what would happen was uh, that um, there were bed bugs. Yeah. Like there were tons of cockroaches in the kitchens of all these tenement apartments. Right. You know, when you turn the light on in the kitchen, they'd scatter. Right. But the, the, the walls were practically black with cockroaches. That somehow didn't bother me as much because I was used to insects in, in the island. Yeah. But um, the bed bugs began to bite, and we had to get rid of them. The word, way you got rid of them was to get a big can of kerosene and uh, rags and soak the rags in kerosene and wipe all of the bed springs, the metal springs. Right. Then with the help of somebody else in the, in the apartment. And mostly we would pick with our hands, we'd pick them out. 
well, now these companies charge all this money. They bring in these dogs to sniff out. You just have to bring, drag it up to the roof of the tenement, kerosene. That's it. Pick it out with your hands. Get high. <laughs> yeah, you said you got inadvertently high from the. That's from the fumes yeah, of the no, kerosene. Getting high with your mom on the Strong roof and the, stuff. and the bed bugs. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was pretty uh, ter terrifying. It's terrible. It's, it's awful, but you know, it's, it's just you get used to things like that because that's what you learn to live with. There's a lot in this book about your relationship with your mom, mm -hmm. um, who took you out, out of Puerto Rico when she was very young and started a new life in New York. Mm -hmm. Left her uh, husband and your brother, and my little in, baby brother, yeah, yeah, in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's a lot of funny things in there about, and of course, you were Googie Gomez in the Ritz, and you won a Tony Award for that. Well, that was my mother I was doing. Well, yeah, because you talked about the pronunciations. The uh, pronunciations, you, you, well, she said, you, she would say things like, uh, in the summertime, she'd say, oh, she'd say, for piss sake, you still have to do any work, let's go and have a nice swing at the bitch. You know, and <laughs> changing the shits on the bed, and <laughs> stuff like that. When I was older, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I said, can't you say beach? Can't you say sheets? She says, no, I can't. And I said, why? She said, because I got trouble with my bowels. <laughs> and you used all of that, the great use of oh, the rich. <laughs> when I did that for Terrence McNally, he fell on the floor. He saw right. me do he saw me do this character that I had invented yeah. at a party at Jimmy Coco's house when I was doing Red Hot Lovers with Jimmy. Right. Jimmy said, You've got to do that crazy character you do. So I sang Everything's Coming Up Roses. <laughs> I had a ding, a ding about jewel, baby. And when we do, were doing the wrist, everybody was always coming to my dressing room and saying, do this like Googie. <laughs> Recite this thing like Googie. Do the Star Spangles Banner. Oh, say, can you see? <laughs> <laughs> you actually made your Broadway debut as a, as a child in a play called Sky Drift at the Belasco Theater, which is Eli Wallach's first play. Yeah. Oh, was that his first play? Wow. His very first play. He's a young man. And how, so, how did you end up on that stage? How did how did you? Get I, that? I auditioned like everybody else did. And so your uh, mother was bringing you around. To auditions she she taped me around for auditions because, and by the way, she was not Mama Rose right. in the least. But she knew what I really, she knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted from the time I, I danced for Grandpa, really, in Puerto Rico. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Sometimes it's just in your genes. Yeah. And um, I auditioned for that and got it. And uh, that, we had never been in a theater in our lives, my mom and wow. I. Wow. Until I was you 13. were starring in a show. <laughs> I was 13 years old. Wow. And mom, my mom certainly had never been in one. I had never been in a theater. I had no idea what a theater was. Right, right. And I love the story. You upset Lily Valenti, <gasps> one of your co-stars. Shall I tell that one? Do we have time for that? Talk, talk about the spaghetti. Okay, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. All right. So my, my mother in this play, Sky Drift, was a Lily Valenti, a, a well-known character actress at yeah. the time. Very good, too. And uh, the play is all about its four little one acts of, of soldiers coming back from the war who had been killed and come back to their families, respective families, Jewish, Italian. Mm. We were the Italian family, to say one last goodbye. And um, so Lily and the family are, and I are eating on, on spaghetti on, on tables. So I saw that the audience was getting restive. And they were coughing a lot and wiggling around in their seats. And I just thought, maybe I better do something to help. I swear it. And I took one strand of spaghetti and slowly sucked it up <laughs> into my mouth. While she's going on about, I love you, you can't be dead. Me, you, me, you, me, you. There's all this is going on. And, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the audience, <clears throat> particularly in front, is starting to giggle and smile. Well, <laughs> the curtain came down. I'm going to the wings. This hand grabs me, this cold, icy hand. She grabs me by my tiny little neck, and she says to me the following, If you ever, <laughs> ever do this again, I will hear about it, and I will find you, and I will kill you. <laughs> I was so amazed. <laughs> I had never seen anybody be that passionate. But in Puerto Rico, I did. But they, <laughs> right. but they never held me by the neck. She was neck. in Puerto Rico. She was Polish. <laughs> <She> was Polish. <laughs> but they never held me by the neck in Puerto Rico. Wow. She <laughs> was one pissed off woman. That's why you don't Can work you with, blame her? That's why you don't work with children and dogs, right? Children and animals. 
<laughs> I really thought I was being helpful. You you also entered into Hollywood with just as much sort of, you know, no experience. experience. Yeah. None at all. I was a Spanish dancer. And uh, I, I got to Hollywood. You know, what's one of the interesting aspects of the, of the book, I think, uh, is that I come from the old Hollywood that no longer exists. Studio system. The studio system. They had what they call, MGM had stables. Right. And they call them stables. They were uh, contract players, young people like Debbie Reynolds, who mm -hmm. was there, and myself, Amanda Blake, Arlene Dahl, mm -hmm. people like that who were being groomed right. for stardom. They put you in every picture they could. You know, with little scene, one scene maybe, two scenes, mm. and just start to groom you and introduce you to, to mm -hmm. the public that way. In my case, I didn't do a lot of movies because they didn't know what to do with well, me. Well, played all sorts of Indian. You could play Indian, I played, Asian, Arab. I became the house ethnic. Right, right. So that I, that meant that because I was Latina, I w I could absolutely. They thought play a Polynesian girl, right. an East Indian girl. An Arabian girl. So I developed what I now call the uh, universal ethnic accent.